Welcome back, folks, to the WP Tonic this week in WordPress and SaaS. It's our monthly roundtable special show. Got my regular panel, got a fantastic guest. She's been dealing with me already. She seems well up for it. I've got Carmen Kendrick with us. Carmen, would you like to quickly introduce yourself to the listeners and viewers? Yeah, so I guess I'll start with my WordPress experience. Um, So I got started with WordPress around 2015 on accident. I was on Shopify and I couldn't afford it anymore. (laughs) And so I ended up finding WooCommerce and going from there. Um, A couple of years ago, I started as a product marketing manager at LearnDash and I'm still there today and leading all of the marketing communications for them. So, Oh, fabulous. I've been really looking forward to you coming on the show. Should be a great discussion. Got my friend Heather. Eva, would you like to introduce yourself to the listeners and viewers? Yes, I am uh, Heather Wild Renzi. I am the CTO of the Difference Consulting, and uh, I've been working with WordPress uh, since uh, version one. That's great. There we go. Um, I've got my co host of the regular weekly show, Kirk. Would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Uh, Kurt Von Annen. I own a company called Manana Nomas. Uh, we're known for getting everything done uh, on time and under budget. And I work with WordPress, mainly membership and learning sites. That's great. I've got my friend, Chris. Chris, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, I'm Chris from Lifter LMS, and I have a podcast for course creators and WordPress pros called LMS Cast. Yes. And I've got my other co host on my other regular show, the Membership Machine Show. Got my uncle Spence. Spence, would you like to introduce yourself? It's uh, Spencer Foreman from SpencerForeman.com, no E, uh, WP Launchify and Launch Flows. That's great. We've got some fantastic stories, folks. We've got the Supreme Court case. I think their judgments will come in today or tomorrow or whatever. Um, or might go on forever. Um, we've got the proposal about WordPress. We've got Obviously, we've got a story from Microsoft and Bean AI, the continued saga, WordCamp Asia. We've got a load of stuff to discuss. Before we go into the main part of the show, I've got a couple of messages from our major sponsors. We'll be back in a few moments, folks. We're coming back. Just want to point out if you're looking for some great special offers or recommendations, you can go over to the WP Tonic slash um, deals, WP Tonic slash deals. And we've got some special offers from the sponsors, plus a curated list of the best plugins. Plus, you can sign up for the weekly WP Tonic newsletter, which is fab. I write it, so it's bound to be fab, isn't it? So this goes, <laughs> this goes straight into it. Um, the Supreme Court case could decide the future of the internet as we know it. So, Carmen, what's your initial views on this particular story? Uh, To me, it's kind of hard to take a stance on it. So what was done was absolutely horrendous and it was wrong. Um, However, can we really blame... Maybe you want to give a quick outline what the, uh, the actual case is about. Yeah, so don't quote me exactly on this. Uh, so it seems to be that there was um, an issue, um, not really an issue, but an incident that happened in Paris. I believe that was Paris where a young lady was murdered. Uh, I hate to even say that word. <laughs> um, because of like basically an extremist group, uh, they were targeted based on that. And I believe Google was being sued um, because of that, because I guess they were pretty much, um, they found other people to... Um, get into this whole group with them and commit this violence of, against this young woman. So uh, they're basically suing Google. And I think before they were shielded from this, from um, some type of law, I forgot which law that was, that they didn't have any responsibility. And so um, now they're trying to figure out like, hey, do these search engines, do these social media platforms, do they really have responsibility uh, when people commit these horrendous crimes against one another? Um, and so it's kind of a hard thing to say because like, Hey, these are people, but the same. Um, I don't really know. It, it can be tough trying to, you know, come up with this stance. So it's definitely wrong what those people, you know, did to that young woman. But um, as far as technology is concerned, do they really have uh, standing based on what people do with that technology? So that's what I gather from it. Well, it's multifaceted, isn't it? You know, so Spence being 
the lawyer or that. What do you think? How are they going to deal with this one? Because I think you need the knowledge of Solomon to deal with these with this one. I actually had to deep dive and put on my lawyer hat. I had it buried in the closet somewhere, but I dusted it off and read all the details. And what's really interesting about this is how when people think of what law and lawyers do and all the rest of the stuff and how it interacts with legislatures and politics in general, you can really see because they named all of the parties. They named all of the how did we get from A to B to C to D? And ironically, that Wolf of Wall Street character is at the heart of all of this, right? His his bad actions in sort of instigating a suit against CompuServe. But what it really comes down to is simple. Legislatures historically carve out all these exceptions to best laid but poorly written legislation. And we can see this in other areas of our society today with abortion rights and so forth. I'm not going there. But the point is, like, you can't just one size fits all. Here's where this is really weird and interesting. On the one hand, the exception that was carved out was when a service provider acts with, let's say, intent to do this to this person or that company and not to the other. However, it's been tormented and twisted into a way to force any kind of content onto anybody when it's targeted advertising. And that was not the intent. So for example, in the old world, if you had Walter Cronkite on TV or you had a newspaper, they were held accountable for everything they published. Like that was the editorial responsibility. Here, this blanket law was twisted by algorithms into, ah, oh, you type this or that keyword, therefore we're, we're gonna send you an unlimited stream of, of hateful or vindictive stuff or advertising. And it's empowered groups of people to be brought together who are amplifying the effect of like how hateful or vindictive they are for whatever reason. And the social media companies are getting their greatest revenue from that, right? So at the end of the day, for those who have already fallen asleep, I think that we're long overdue for an overhaul and that thing we're going to talk about with the Twitter blue mark and stuff feeds into this. We're past the point of our naivete of believing that people can anonymously post hateful and vindictive stuff without there being some kind of controls or limits at the top end. And we have to also detach all of the stuff that happens to us every day with targeted marketing based on keywords and stuff they're scamming off us because that's just amplifying it in a world of billions of people to the point where when AI kicks into that model, it's over for all of us. So yeah, I agree with you for once. This is the biggest case I can think of. Unfortunately, I'm not really optimistic how this Supreme Court is going to handle it. I, I just rely on Sydney now anyway. So that was, don't... by the way, I had to use more words in that that I, I, I ever wanted to use. A lot of times I talk and I want to use a lot of words. This is just not an easy thing to think about. I was, very, I was very impressed, actually. Uh, there we go. So, however, I've got such mixed feelings about this case because I think you do have to take some responsibility what's on your website, on your platform, on some takes, I know they don't want to take any responsibility for anything when it suits them. They just want the money, you know. They like the money, but they don't like any responsibility. Or am I, I mean, just? It's like telephone spamming or TV ads or any of the things in the past, you know, like selling cigarettes to kids on billboards and stuff. That used to be common practice until somebody woke up to it. And here we've gone 10, 15 years now of this face, whatever Facebook since twenty oh six, just building up this spam machine that puts together hateful people and amplifies it. And then worse, the bots take it and then hurt other people with what those groups have been creating on their own. It's oh, just, there you go. I didn't know your day was half a spe spe yeah. spe there no. you go. Uh, Rob, right. uh, Rob, sorry. No, I mean, I, I agree with uh, Spencer in, in a lot of this. And I mean, that's, that's where ethics, uh, I mean, and I think this is coming to the forefront now because of all of the, um, I mean, the chat GPT and the AI and, and everything that, that people are seeing because it's, it's just happening so fast now that, um, I mean, I just take this week, uh, I don't know if you saw that the replica bots, um, people are, uh, yeah, yeah, Jonathan saw this. Um, I mean, people are, are really upset because they were neutered. Um, because of all of the not safe for work content that they were starting to spew. But now uh, people that had really grown attached to these as alternate um, surrogates to their, like as relationship bots um, are saying that suddenly these, these people 
are no longer themselves. So uh, it's. I've had that feeling for years, Eva. But but I mean, how far can a company go? Uh, like how much protections should a company have? And uh, if if the government has to step in, if governments have to step in uh, to to say that that companies aren't uh, doing Heather, enough. Heather, we are talking about Facebook and Twitter protections. No, I, I know, but it's it's starting there. But these smaller companies are waking up to the fact that what they're doing could spiral out of control faster than they realize. And uh, I mean, Facebook and Twitter and Google and all of the other companies that created the internet uh, didn't think about it. And this is where we are. So um, I think that it's it's a dangerous precipice that we're at now. And this the reason that this is at the Supreme Court, I mean, it's taken this long for these cases to be seen by the Supreme Court. But we're yeah. going to see a lot more of them. So, Chris, um, I'm a bit cynical about this because there's loads of evidence, loads of um, leaked evidence about what was going on in Facebook when um, when they were building up their platform, that the higher management, the founder and some of the key people in Facebook, they actually, it wasn't like this just happened by accident, some of the things that Spencer were talking about. They actually knew what was going on and they, they just promoted it hard because they just wanted the money. They just ramped it up and they just said, it just get on with it and we deal with the consequences after after we've started finishing counting all the money or am i so have they brought this upon themselves by their own actions in a way i don't know the inner workings of the management team there but i do know that from a marketing and a sales perspective emotion is viral and you can engineer virality by um focusing on emotions, positive and negative. The most viral emotion on the internet is outrage. And that causes, you know, it, it misaligns incentives between content creators or platform creators to incentivize for outrage uh, and then make more money the more distribution that gets. There's a couple of key chess pieces on the board just to throw out there, which is first the difference between a publisher and a distributor. So the creator of the content is one thing. The distributor is another thing. If we go back in time to the newsstand, if you have a um, newspaper, like Spencer mentioned, with an editor, there's the publisher there. But then the newsstand is the distributor. So should the newsstand be held liable for what happened at the writer or the editorial level at the publisher? So one could argue that Google is just a distributor. And therefore, um, <clears throat> it's not, even though it, it does influence it, it's not actually the publisher. So there's a, there's a lot of nuance in that. And then also, if you kind of tie it into WordPress, where WordPress is decentralized. So in this case, the, the publisher and the distributor, there's, it's harder to point a finger. WordPress is known for being, um, you know, people can do whatever they want with it. It's open source. It's GPL. People can put whatever they want up. But then what happens is it falls on the hosting companies for some hosts allow explicit content or different categories of content that they do not um, allow on their platform, which I think is a good thing. But somebody, there's, there has to be that ethics layer somewhere. And when you throw in user-generated content, whether it's on social media or on blogs or wherever, um, you're just opening up that door for a lack of that editorial layer and that, that kind of um, governance from an ethics standpoint. So it definitely needs to be figured out both in big tech and in small tech. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. The only, the, the only remark I would place on that, Chris, is that it was a little bit this difference as a publisher and uh, a distributor, but they were both. They were, trying to, they were trying to have it both ways because the reason why I say that, Chris, is that they were utilizing technology to, for actual automated curation, and they they were creating the most evil, promoting the most vile, horrible, 
stuff possible because they knew that's what encouraged more time on their platform, which generated more income for them. There's one significant, sorry, Chris, one significant thing I want to add on that. And you, I agree with your premise, but it's a one-way street in traditional publishing. These platforms are sideways, two-way streets, and that's all of the difference in the world. If you hated what something in the Chicago Sun Times said, you couldn't like all of a sudden go to 10 million people and say why somebody's an idiot. You you had to submit a letter to the editor and then they curated it. But Google and, and Facebook, everything just lets everybody go sideways. So Kirk, I'll, sorry, to uh, you. no, it's all right. So Kirk, um, you know we're dealing with Google. You know they like you know do no evil. <laughs> you know um, and they you know um, this particular case. The people, the family that's suing Google, I, I think they've got a good case because I dealt into it. And Google was, through their automated platform, were promoting, allowing the most vile stuff on their platform and making out they didn't know. And what has come out is that they, they, they were doing exactly what Facebook was doing. They were utilizing their technology to promote the most vile stuff possible. What do you reckon? I'm someone that likes to drill things down as simply as possible. And when I take a look at Facebook, Twitter, and all these tools and Google, um, at the end of the day, it's a tool. It's a tool to me, right? It's like a, it's like a hammer. And so, you know, when someone like Paul Pelosi gets dinged in the head with a hammer, they don't sue Stanley for making the hammer, right? And that's like an example that like Google's going to say, hey, we're just a tool and other people used it. But multiple people on this panel mentioned the word ethics. And then we also mentioned greed. Well, ethics and greed don't go well together, right? And so um, when companies like the Twitter files released that, you know, they were using these tools, they were meeting with people and curating the information, like you said, Jonathan, they went beyond the scope of being just the tool maker. And I think that that's where that yeah. gray area is going to be. Yeah, I think that, I think that's well put, Kurt. That's where they're in dicey land. You know, this might really come to bite them on the backside because um, they wanted it both ways. They make out they're just providing a platform, but what's come to light, they were much more than just providing a platform. They were actively new and, and manipulating the technology um, to promote content which generated more clicks, more involvement, more revenue from their advertisers. Um, so they're trying to play it both ways. So let's go on to oh let's go on to something much nicer. Let's go let's go to WordPress, doesn't it? The wolf, the cuddly feel of the WordPress community sometimes. Uh um, story two. Um the new new proposal six to update WordPress release process for merging Gutenberg features. Oh my god, these tavern titles. <laughs> They're not getting any better, are they? Um, Spencer, um, my take on this is that um, it's a bit like story one in some ways. Uh, consequences of decisions are coming back to bite a bit. Um, and this is another where a decision was made and it's coming back to bite a bit. Um, maybe you can give what you think this story is really about. Sure. I, I think that this one I'll do less words. In general, the Gutenberg editor, although I'm going to say Matt now, I'm not going to say fearless leader, but Matt has indicated that it's a core part of WordPress. It's still being treated as a separate thing. And interestingly enough, that sort of creates these paradoxes, right? Because like you either say what you mean and mean what you say, or you don't. Well, there's been so much such a flurry of activity and people wanting to contribute that they're essentially saying there should be different rules for submitting things and getting approval for things in the standalone block editor, the beta, if you want to call that, when the process is obviously pretty well established for core. And this is the paradox because people are saying, slow down. There's half on each side. Like th this is the way we do it or no, it has to be this way. And so what it's doing in my mind is amplifying some of the other political issues that we've talked about regarding how does 
uh, WordPress treat updates or, or various plugin authors or what's the process or who gets spanked or who gets released. There's all these things that are different based upon what day of the week or who you're friends with or what fearless leader Matt says. And I think that that's interesting because that's the only way things are going to change. But for the majority of people, it makes no difference because on my own personal note, I never use the beta plugin. Uh, for the same reason that uh, our friend Jason Cohen indicates WP Engine has policies that they don't release to their customers the, the new update of WordPress for a little time either. They put a buffer in there because bad things happen and just don't need the aggravation. So like I would say use the plugin just for experimental purpose. Just wait for it to show up ultimately otherwise. Yeah, so Carmen, what did you think of this little diddy on the tavern? Uh, so it was a lot to take in. Maybe they should just write it a little bit more in layman terms. Like I, that I, 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 think that, I think they need your help, Carmen. Yeah. <laughs> like, hey, just write this down. Um, I really like the last one. It's just like I really don't have a lot to say on it because I'm just not really into like the Gutenberg thing. I mean, I use it, but it's not like it, it affects my workflow. Um, and a lot of times people just use page builders. And so it's like, hey, how does this affect people? And that's what people want to see. They want to see, like, how does this actually affect me in the way that I use WordPress? Um, so, yeah, I really don't have a lot to say on this one. So you're, you're, you're not uh, taking the religion of Gutenberg? You're not? A... No, I mean, I don't use a classic editor anymore. So I think that's something to, you know, rave about. <laughs> but uh, that's about it when it comes to Gutenberg for me. Oh, well, there we are. <laughs> well, this goes to the opposite. Somebody that loves the classic editor, have a, have a, you know, you just want to go in, you know, all this Gutenberg stuff. <laughs> uh, Rob, so what do you reckon about this, Heather? Oh, you've muted, Heather. Are you still muted, Heather? You're mute. I said, you know, I hate Gutenberg um, so much. <laughs> so, so much. Um, so, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think I think that uh, I mean paying attention. But why, to Heather? Why, why, why won't you come to the light? You know, why do you hate it with such a passion? <laughs> I mean, just <laughs> sorry. Just think about how far behind. Like, I mean, we're talking about them finally putting in stuff that everybody else has been working on for years. I mean, they're thinking about adding this now that like people have already been using for years now. And every time there's a Gutenberg update, everybody else is like, oh no, what are we gonna break now? So, and, and I know that's why they're cautious about doing it because like literally all their bread and butter breaks. Like everything at, at uh, Automatic is like all the money that they're making from all the developers breaks and suddenly everybody has to catch up so yeah i mean it's just it's annoying i just i just don't <laughs> from a business perspective i think they should just like say just outsource the whole thing and say um here's our core product and we're not even going to try to make a like i mean we're just a php backend now so you what you're saying just to, before bring the other in is that I understand why, in some ways, why Matt, because um, being just PHP, it wasn't. It's very much. It's very much developer driven, and its ecos is developer driven. And WordPress just wasn't. It just wasn't trendy, was it? You know, it's just got a dire, and it just wasn't keeping up. So putting a veneer of new technology on top because you want to keep you wanted to keep um it um so old versions you don't want to do what joomla uh, and other open source platforms and they've dug a grave for themselves with compatibility so you put a, a veneer of new technology on the front which is javascript um driven it, it, it was quite clever in a way, but I just think um, there were consequences. Would you agree with that, Heather? Yeah, but the thing is, that's not where they make their money from. I mean, they make their money from all of the, the plugin developers and, and I mean, and, and they make their money from the, the community. So if, if 
every time they do this, they screw up the community and they screw up all of the their revenue streams, then I, I think that there's no point. Yeah. So, Kirk, what do, do you reckon about this? Well, Jonathan, uh, I reckon I agree with Carmen. I thought that article was written by AI. I thought Sydney wrote that article. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my head was spinning a little bit. I was like, I was like, you know, there's a reason why I'm not a developer. There's a reason why I use page builders, and I do use Gutenberg and 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 right. Um, I'm not really horribly bought off on on why it's such a big issue. Um, as, as a person that works with established product, like Spencer had said, it's like when I was in the power sports industry, people would say, I never buy the first year a new motorcycle comes out, you know, because that's where all the bugs are. And it's like, it's, I kind of feel that way with software. I want to see it proven first. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I jump in as an early adopter and I play with things in the background, but I don't give it to my clients yet. And so uh, for, for me, this article was, was entertaining to try and read and understand. Um, but I'm not the I'm not the brains to make a real comment on, yeah. on the actual structure or the process. I was it was a challenge. I was challenging the panel. They, they put that. So so Chris, what, got any insights on what you thought about this? Because I, I think it wasn't the best written article I've ever come across, but I think it kind of shows some of the dilemmas that the automatic and other key leaders in the WordPress project are facing at the present moment. What's your own thoughts about this? I agree. It's a, it's a leadership thing. It's a company culture thing. You know, Facebook for a while had to, and still does have the company culture thing of move fast and break things. And then on the other end of the spectrum is um, let's be really slow and methodical and be process driven and respect the process. And, this just looks like conflict between those two different ways of being. If Gutenberg is very much new and uh, needing that kind of more startupy, scrappy, fast, like down to the last minute changes kind of culture versus an established process that's been built to make sure that the ecosystem has time to test against what's going on and the whole QA process and everything is super tight and smooth. It sounds like they just need to my biggest concern here is that a divided culture within a company just ultimately slows down the product. So pick one, be scrappy and be okay with bugs or slow down and be more process driven. And it's okay to break the rules sometimes, but if it's happening over and over, you know, they need to make a decision and that's a leadership thing. Could they, could they just have accepted Gutenberg as a plug-in competitor to other page builders and just just tried to make it the best page builder um, possible and keep the but keep it really as a set, really quasar type in a much in a much more formatic way. Keep it in the in as a plugin as a separate team. We're just building. We're going to compete with other plugins, but we're we're just going to make it the best and keep the core separate. Was it? Was it a bit of a mistake the way it's been? Was that one of the key mistakes here, maybe? Or, or do you, utilizing the word mistake? Am I incorrect utilizing that word? I don't think it was a, a mistake because ultimately WordPress is for all the sites. So if they're going to make this change, they're not really competing. Uh, yeah. WordPress is like the underlying technology and everything kind of folds in on top. So, so WordPress is always trying to be layer one. Being a layer two page builder is just against their ethos of being yeah. the foundational platform. Yeah, I agree with that. Well, we're going to go for our break. The panel's been well behaved, very intense. We've got a great guest, Gary Carmen. She's been fab. Uh, um, we're going to go for our break. We've got some other fantastic stories. We will be back in a few moments, folks. This podcast episode is brought to you by Lifter LMS, the leading learning management system solution for WordPress. If you or your client are creating any kind of online course, training-based membership website, or any type of e-learning project, Lifter LMS is the most secure, stable, well-supported solution on the market. 
Go to LifterLMS.com and save 20% at checkout with coupon code PODCAST20. That's PODCAST20. Enjoy the rest of your show. Back. The panel have been very insightful, well behaved. I actually think they've read the, the stories as well to some extent. Um, I don't, but there we go. Uh, um, like I say, if you want to help the show, please join us live. Um, what you know, either at the end of the month, the last Thursday of the month, or you can join us on the, the membership machine show that we do every Friday. Me and Spence, we have a laugh. We have a look at a WordPress topic, and you can join us live on that at around 8.30 Pacific Standard Time. So let's go straight into it. Oh, my God, fathers, let's, let's talk about this. Uh, Microsoft Bing AI and Sydney. Sydney's be wild. So Sydney is this voice, this deeper personality that appears if you spend four hours interrogating um, chat. GPT um, and ask it all weird questions, you get Sydney. So, Carmen, have you been playing and inter interrogating and getting Sydney to reply? Uh, no, I just, well, I don't use Sydney, but um, the OpenAI chat GPT, I do use it quite a lot for a, a blog post outline, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> I just don't see why people, I think it's like the appeal of like Siri when it came out a few years ago and you asked Siri like, hey Siri, what are you doing? It's like, and it gives you some dumb, you know, like, hey, why are you asking me that? Ask me like, and then she starts talking to me, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, i <I'm>, uh... <laughs> That normally happens to Uncle Spencer. I can't he's, he's... say the names. That's so <laughs> funny. Like she just and any other time I ask to speak to her, she never picks up. So that's funny that she would want to talk now. But I was just saying that like, it's just an appeal. Like when it first came out, you would just ask it anything, and I think that's what people are doing, and they're surprised by what it's saying. But it's almost like when you talk to someone and they're just annoyed by what you're asking them. It's like you just start saying anything at that point. Like yeah, sure, the sky is green. Um, whatever you want to uh, hear. So it's it's funny. I mean, I can see what it also goes back to our our first discussion about um, can this be used in a nefarious way? Uh, these groups of people that are looking for sinister things to do. Um, it can be, you know, used that way. But I'm just like, why are you even asking these questions? But it can uh, go, I guess, both ways. So, Spencer, this, I think... What got me going was, as I read this article and watched a couple of videos, this reporter, who's a quite exper experienced tech uh, reporter, um, he seemed to go the same way with this Google engineer. I forgot his name that started. Because he started, he went on a bender, didn't he? You know, this thing, this thing is intelligent. This, this was one of the greatest tech experiences I've ever had. You know, they seem to get sucked in to think this bloody thing is actually alive, don't they? Well, uh, yes. But the, the difficulty, which was explained to me by somebody, um, I think it was, I was listening to Guy Raz's How I Built This. It was actually going back to Sam Altman's conversation, but then it was followed over someone else. See, the thing is that human language conveys a lot of emotive feelings. And when you, back in college, I was a psychology major, which I used to joke, I was a major in un unemployment. But it did serve me later, kind of like that uh, Steve Jobs with the fonts story. Because like marketing and human psychology become a big part of how we respond. <laughs> so this tool has been trained to feed back to us in the same words we use when we're trying to convey emotions to other human beings. Even if it's gibberish, it's just the way that it's doing that affects people strongly. And that's where a lot of these responses are coming from because it's set up to amplify the responses that you would give to something that's like evocative. Like if you're, I won't say any of my girlfriend's names because I have three of them here, you know, the A and the, you know, okay. So if you spoke out loud and, and that device spoke to you, you respond as if it's like your spouse or your, your kids, like, shut up, I don't wanna talk right now, I'm busy, I'm on a show. But in reality, it's a device. So that's the issue. The issue is human beings are not yet accustomed to the oh wow part of this. 
But when you start to use it, and I've been really enjoying this for everything from coding to copywriting to whatever, you start to see where the cracks are in the sidewalk and you step over them. And it's, it's not really a human being in the end. This reporter or reporters, what they did is they just kept amping up the oh, oh wow part of it until they got the kind of yeah, outrage. It was just the language. This is the greatest technology I've ever used. You know, he, he, he really, he like, really like, started going on a bender, didn't he? he? Here's a test. Like, you wouldn't do this because none of us are that dumb now. But if you, like, legitimately gave out your phone number to 8 million marketers, or if you legitimately started naming products in front of your A device in the kitchen instead of asking it what time of day it is or setting a timer, you will get what you ask for. You'll F around and you'll find out at what it does to you. But this is the same thing, just with more control. So, Chris, it also, um, I, I really love animals, you know, um, but... The thing I don't like with pet owners is when they produ they really think their pets are almost human. Like they treat them like children, you know, they dress them. I hate it when they put clothes on dogs or cats. And they um, they treat them like bait, you know, like they were humans. They project emotion upon a creature. Oh, and there's there's a term there's a term where we see faces or images in anthropomorphic. Also, thank you. There's this. Is this what's going on here, Chris? Big ways. I don't think so. That's what what's going on here because the AI doesn't have emotions, whereas the human has emotions and sees the dog as a as a kid or whatever. Which I like. I, I have dogs. I love dogs. I love yeah. on them. I've even given them clothes before. Have you? So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, I have a dog that has a sweater. I mean, he gets cold. But the oh, uh, oh that's so sweet of you, Chris. <laughs> but uh, the difference is, like, if you're going to use the AI to get, it's not going to get a sweater for me. But that's just <laughs> me, isn't it? You know, there we go. You know. Well, that's an emotional decision you're making about your gift giving. But the uh, <laughs> the, the AI uh, is good at facts. You know, like, hey, when did this event happen in history, or what are the seven ways to do X? But when emotions get involved, um, AI isn't really there yet. And I think a lot of emotional stuff, like Spencer mentioned psychology and it's complex and we have all these traditions and um, subconscious thoughts and dreams that play into the language that we use. AI doesn't have any of that. So of course it's gonna turn into a psychotic, um, uh kind of response because it's just not it does not carry that emotional part of the brain human brain and maybe one day it'll get there be able to see patterns enough to be able to more closely mimic human behavior but uh language is one of the key things that makes us human and it's going to be hard to actually make it think for itself from an emotional standpoint it just occurred to me Heather. i think this is a how moment this is a 2000 uh space odyssey moment you know we all brought up on our if we got into tech you know normally we loved our science fiction and um we loved our novels and um 2000 was a kind of uh you know it's just a fab film and we all we all dream that hell moment is this is this part of it you know they're going on the childhood they always wanted that, that moment where we have a machine like hell you know I don't think you want to do this, Jonathan. Um, <laughs> so the, uh, no, I mean, I think that, like I said, we, we're getting to that point. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, we're, we're starting to see, uh, I mean, we were already starting to see people in certain countries uh, that are not just anthropomorphizing their, their computers and their, their, um, uh, their replicas but i mean we're we're really starting to see the beginnings of of like a religion about this um so people are are seeing uh patterns in the ai that they believe is is kind of like a, a god but that's the interesting thing is we're the ones that created it so i mean if they think it's the pattern behind all things but we're the creators of it so i mean it's this vicious cycle but I mean, I can I can definitely see within the next 10, 20 years some 
uh, like techno religion being created where people believe that the machines are uh, better than us because they have no emotion and they can't, uh, they can't possibly be any worse than any of the religions that are out there. And I mean, so this is like, it all goes back to ethics. It all goes back to who is creating these things and, and what is their intent behind it. And when you see like Sydney or Venom or any of these uh, AI personalities being created, it all goes into, as Spencer was saying, garbage in, garbage out. Like, what were you directing it to do? It can't do anything that you weren't telling it to do. I mean, go, go back to uh, Ty, like the Microsoft chatbot years ago. Like, I mean, within like a day, it was becoming misogynistic and racist and and all of those things because people were feeding it all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, I, I see all the Teslas crashing. I mean, my Tesla drives just fine um, because I'm driving it fine. I'm teaching it. I'm teaching it like it's a student driver. And other people, I'm assuming, are just like pretending that their cars automatically can drive, and that's why they're crashing into to things. So, I mean, it's garbage in, garbage out. It's like the yeah, Planet yeah. of the Apes, where they worship the nuclear warhead. That religion. Remember the early 1968 version of it? If you ever when you're a kid, it's just crazy, but it's true. I don't know, but the poor machines, the stuff they've got to put up with, they just want to do their machines. Well, stuff. so that's why I always say please and thank you with my Alexa. And uh, Is and, it? and whenever my uh, my robot vacuum gets stuck, I, well, always, I always like politely put it back on it. So, I'll, boot, like, I'll boot it. That's what I do. Oh, no, I'm, all, I'm always like, oh, Rocky, I'm so sorry you got stuck. Well, let me put you back oh. on the... <laughs> Let me be Aww. more be more polite with mine. I kicked it the other day, so let me not do that anymore. Yeah, <laughs> uh, they're saving all that data. Give it a they're, time. they're recording all that data, and someday when the machines have risen, they're gonna remember. <laughs> oh, I'm not gonna be around. I'm, I'm gonna go. It's, so, not, let's go. it's not that far, John. <laughs> It's a few people in the WordPress community would like me to go very quickly. Uh Rob, so let's go, let's go forth. Uh Rob. Let's go on to a nicer subject. Um, I know the last one was okay. No, poor the poor chat chat bomb. Uh, WordCamp Asia. So, um, what should it all be? I thought it's a you know. I wish I was there, Thailand. Um, was you tempted to go, Chris? Was you tempted to go to Thailand? WordCamp I was, Asia. I was tempted to go. Um, there's just only so many events and conferences you can go to in a year but i'll i'll catch the next word camp asia this one looked like it was it was really great and i talked to some people that were there and uh somebody made an interesting comment that they will sponsor word camp asia and europe going forward but just attend word camp us and i thought that was just an interesting comment right was isn't it there's many ways we could go there but it isn't so common i think the real excitement growth is in asia in a way um i went i went to the europe i won't be going this year to the athens but i attended porto portugal it was a fab affair carmen and i went the um wordpress usa i, I just spent the whole thing interview and I think I did 16 interviews Carmen it was killed me um but I did it but um it was an interesting affair I liked where but I, I enjoyed Porto but it was Porto Portugal so um what's your own take of what your observations of what WordCamp Asia and how it went down Carmen yeah from the pictures on Twitter I saw and uh, all the Thai food I was very jealous I love Thai food and I just thought every time I seen a picture hey that should have been me mm. <laughs> uh, but yeah I think it was a great event I haven't really talked to anyone that's gone um Michelle Frechette, uh, she's on our team. She went, so I hadn't had a chance to talk to Michelle yet, but it um, looks like she did a lot of networking. looks like it was a great event overall. So maybe next year I'll get a chance to attend. So, yeah. So I think the big growth um, in development and in general growth in WordPress is in that particular market. Would you agree with that, Carmen? Yeah, definitely. A lot of our customers um, are in, on that part of the world or in that part of the world, I should say. So, yeah, it's definitely growing. 
So, Spence, what was your observation? It, it seemed a pretty good affair. Um, you know, uh, you know, Thailand seemed fab, didn't it? I mean, at least one, two, three, at least four of us here. I don't know, Carmen, if you were in San Diego. Were you in San Diego as well? Yeah, I was. So I didn't get a chance to meet you then, I don't think. But, like, for those of us who are in San Diego, I definitely have fond, fond recollections and given how beautiful the location was for this event, I wish I could have told my kids to take a walk. Daddy's going away for a while. But uh, my best hope for that will be maybe Greece or yawn, yawn, Maryland. I don't think they have any beaches in Maryland. That was an unfortunate choice. But nevertheless, uh, Greece might be on the agenda. But I was definitely envious of those who got to have fun because it looked awesome. The problem with Athens, when you know it's not quite, but it's going to be bloody hot. Not quite as bad as July and August, well, but it's going to be bloody hot. Bath bathing suits for the main event. I mean, have it done by the pool. It was a nine thousand degrees after the rain left in San Diego. So I mean, you know, it was initially it was yucky the first day, but what are you going to do? Be there sweating. you go. So, um, Kirk, what was your thoughts about WordCamp Asia? Well, WordCamp San Diego was my first ever WordCamp. And since I've been really glued to all things WordPress and community and stuff. So a lot of the people that I met in San Diego went to WordCamp Asia and I tracked them on social media and we had chats and DMs and stuff. And as a foodie, I got to oh. tell you, I was jealous I wasn't there. The food looked amazing. Um, and then there was a gentleman that worked with Lifter for a while, Sikander. He gave a, a, a talk at WordCamp Asia that was pretty, pretty good. So it looked like the event was um, a winner from, from all respects that I saw from the outside looking in. Um, and from a community perspective, um, I was in WordPress a long, long time and not part of any of the community. And then finally, I, I got into the community after almost decades of not being there. And, and I just got to encourage people. It's such an open, welcoming spot to be. I mean, even if I don't agree with people on, on every facet of life, in the WordPress space, people are really giving and really generous. And you can see that when they do these events and when they share online with the stuff that they do. It's a really strong community. Yeah. So, Heather, um, I, I know it's the same... I suppose you know it was a new it was a new event. I think they really pulled it off, but um, a lot of the hosting, some of the bigger players, it costs a fair bit of money to go to these, but they seem to cough up the money, don't they, and go to them. So um, I suppose because it's not cheap to do one of these events, is it? No, I, and I mean depending on where it's held i mean in asia it's it's less expensive to hold something like this but then you've got to have uh you've got to build in the the people coming to the event so i mean traveling to asia especially now with um although the flights are less expensive and if if uh like going into a community like like asia where they don't necessarily have these types of events um uh, so there's not that many WordPress community people like breaking into a new location. I mean, it's community events are difficult too. <laughs> it's they're they're expensive. They're uh, like making sure that you have the right speakers there is always is always difficult because if you're trying to attract um, local people, um, you want to have a good mix of international people to come. Um, but again, attracting those people to fly out and spend their own money to come to a community event in another country, another continent that they might not come to normally. It's, it's hard. It's, it's really hard. Yeah, I know. I thought the people at Porto did a fabulous job. You know, um, it was a big event, almost 3000 people, you know, had a break for almost two to three years. I just thought it was a they did fantastic. I just don't. They got some grief from some people about some mishaps, but um, I think they really did fab and pulled off a fabulous event at Porto. Um, so on to story, a next story. Um, Facebook, Instagram are testing and selling blue checks for twelve bucks a pop per month. So Carmen, I thought you had some great insights about this story. What, what's your 
What's your insights about this one, Carmen? Yeah, so I'm for it. Um, just because I actually lost my Instagram account a couple of years ago. Um, someone was impersonating me. And then when I, when I reported it, I got um, pretty much booted for impersonating myself. <laughs> um, so I'm uh, that's, that, that happened to me many times. Actually, yeah. Girl. And I'm just like, you know, I kind of just I kind of gave up and I just use it to, just for personal posting at this point because I don't want that to happen again. Um, but to my point earlier, I talked about um, how we went from your page. We get a, a bunch of organic reach and then you had to pretty much pay to play. So hopefully um, we're able to uh, get more reach without having to pay for ads because ads can be tricky for a lot of people. Um, you almost have to have like an expert on board to even get your ad started where it's actually producing something from you like any row ads for you. Uh, so hopefully it will give people more organic reach on there and stop with some of the bots and impersonation. And it's not such a process where it's like, I know someone on Instagram and that's how I got my blue check. Um, Cause I feel like that's not really effective for what it's supposed to be because everyday people are being impersonated on Instagram and Facebook. So um, have, I think Carmen made a great point there because um, especially with Facebook, um, it was, they they kind of semi destroyed the usefulness of a Facebook page in a way, because they they crippled the organic reach to such an extent that they just ruined. It, yeah, you know? um, it's a balance, isn't it? Do you think that that that's what the, one of the things they're looking? Because they, Carmen is in their announcement. They said if you get this blue cheek blue check and you're paying this, you get a bit more organic juice. That they seem to be hinting it, don't they, Heather? Uh, I mean, yes, but also I think that um, just like with Twitter, it's going to just be another, it's it's a cheap way of advertising. So I think that it's easy enough to get somebody on your team to, to verify themselves so they'll, they can just hire people that have IDs, get their accounts verified, and then fire them right away. Um, so... They, I mean, like, it's not going to stop bot farms. No, no, I don't think so. All right. So, Spence, what do you reckon about this story? Um, I, I honestly don't think I can add too much to it other than to say, you know, well, I'm, I'm going to say nothing about this one. I don't have much to say. About it. Other than um, it seems like I, when I was younger, I sold a thing that was essentially like a photograph and, uh, it was like proving the point that people will pay for something that they perceive to have value. And, you know, it doesn't really do anything. It's just like a perception. So, so, so I think they're all struggling with this a bit, Chris, aren't they? You know, Google, this idea that um, chat AI is just going to replace search. I actually, I've actually, I actually found you now Google were playing with it where they just gave you a list you put a question in, and on the top, they gave you a list of, or, or uh, outline of the answer. I always found them like useful, useless, really. I just wanted, I just wanted links to pages that actually answered my bloody question. Or am I just a luggite, Chris? Well, that goes back to the debate between publisher versus distributor. Those instant answers at the top of a Google search results screen are literally kind of the answer. Therefore, they're publishing the content, not just distributing you a link. Um, so I think that's an interesting thing to look at. It's also can be seen as negative to the content creator in terms they don't actually get the traffic because Google is surfacing the result. And that's a whole other discussion. But going back to the the ethics and what's going on here at Facebook with paying for, um, you know, a better experience, in some ways, there might be a silver lining here in that um, if monetization is not just coming through, uh, you know, clickbait and playing on negative emotions and things like that, and they actually develop a strong business model around a recurring subscription for a better user experience, which obviously I don't think YouTube has figured out. I don't know a single person who has paid for YouTube Red or whatever it's called to have an ad-free experience. I think that's kind of a, oh, if Spencer has, I it's think- It's worth every penny of the $17. It probably is. As, as a every, marketer, every I actually penny. like watching the ads, but um, I, I understand I would probably not do it uh, if, I, if I wasn't into that kind of thing. But um, 
It also yeah, comes free you. with other subscriptions too. Okay. Okay. I, 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 Chris just made me think of something that I want to throw in because like, that's a good point. YouTube TV is a different service than YouTube premium. And my kid wanted to watch Blackhawks games, Chicago Blackhawks hockey and so forth. And the only way to really get it is you need a premium service. Point is it's $64 a month for essentially old school cable TV experience, but they offer a two week free trial. If you give a unique credit card and a Gmail account. So we've been just rolling over through all daddy's credit cards for two weeks at a time. <laughs> now, but the point is, when you're using the $64 a month service, every single thing is loaded with ads. Like yeah. watching Shark Tank on ABC or watching the, like ad, 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 versus my $17 a month for regular YouTube, where the experience is like, I can watch thousands of hours in a row without ads. Now, one of the things Chris just triggered me on was like with the Facebook. The thing that's weird about this, and I heard about this on the, uh, the, the Jason Calcanis show and Molly were talking about, is that Zuckerberg's no fool. He gets a bunch of people to perceive, like I was saying, pay $12 a month to get verified and give us your ID, by the way. And guess what? $5 billion of revenue falls from the sky because they have 3.6 billion users. Even 1% of those paying 12 bucks a month is like $5 billion a month of revenue for free to replace all the money he flushed down the toilet on doing the VR meta thing. And that's the bottom line. It doesn't do anything because everybody will just have a blue checkbox versus YouTube. Getting rid of those ads is tangibly different in how you experience it versus seeing a blue check mark next to somebody. Fearless Leader did a joke on Tumblr this week where he sold like a blue check mark for Tumblr and, and made a bunch of money out of it. It was, you know, ta-da. Didn't do yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, you go, you go, don't you need the money, Dave? You know, uh, when, about AI, I was listening. They were saying Microsoft. They reckon. Um, I think I'm right about this. One of those chat queries cost them in computer um, usage about five cents. Um, as as a model, it's a bit. You can see. That, that that soon gets very expensive. But the other point they were saying that if Bing can just get one percent growth in search, one percent will generate two billion dollars of revenue. So you can see um, you got to, you got to give it to the leadership of Microsoft. They've done a good um, PR game here because if they can just get two percent of the search market. That's four. That's four billion. Um, so, the mathematics. In, well, I, I can see I'm boring the panel here, but there we go. There we are. So, um, I think. Do you want to discuss the last story, or should we wrap it up? Because I think you're getting a bit bored, panel. I've not entertained you enough. What do you want to do, panel? You want to discuss Mr. Musk and his sacking of more staff, or shall we call it a day? I don't know that people like my opinion on Mr. Uh, Mr. Elon Musk or not. I. Um, oh, you might want to give it. What's your opinion on this story, then, Kurt? <laughs> <laughs> I think we should all just mind our business and let the man run the business that he bought. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a really unique thing. Uh, with my corporate experience, I can remember walking and looking at people's cubicles, walking by to get my cup of coffee while I was wasting company time and see people shopping for mountain bikes and sweaters and all kinds of things that had nothing to do with running the business. Oh, you, you they, need these, Heather, they need to have when Heather's running the business. And, they, and when you see these there's, social there's, videos. There's none of that, Kirk. There's none of yeah, the when, shopping when, on the channel when, when Heather's when, around. When, 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 when you see the social videos of a day in the life of a Twitter employee and it's, you know, I get to the office around 10, I have a bowl of oatmeal, I go to the nap room, I play some ping pong, I talk to the other developers for a couple hours, I go and get some ice cream. Um, we have a meeting for about 40 minutes and we draw on the wall and then we go and take a, a nap cluster. It's like, what? What is <laughs> happening? Where, where do I apply? <laughs> that's like my you just described my dream job for all right there. just make sure and you so, save your paycheck because you will be laid off yeah. <laughs> so, so the, the people on the outside see this and then the, the, then the news comes out that he's made some layoffs and we're supposed to feel sorry for this group and and i know that the economy is hard and i know a lot of people are doing layoffs but when you look at the 
there, there's a study out there that says that the sales of a company are generated by the square root of the number of employees there. And when you look at how big these companies have gotten, you start doing that math and you go, so wait a minute, only the square root of my company actually generates productivity for me. And Elon Musk is one of those guys. He's like, I'm a contrarian. I want to do it different. And I don't want to have the square root of my employees produce. I want the balance of the square root to be productive. And he'll keep whittling away until he gets the best of the best in there. And more power to him if he gets away with it. Yeah, so um, have a... Um... How much do you, how much do you think he's reduced the company by? Because uh, when you start when you're on uh, when you get over twenty percent, you're getting into the realm of thirty forty percent. I just want what the hell were they all doing? Uh, got any insight ever? Oh, she, oh, she's doing his shower. Let's go over to Chris then. She's busy. She's, she's no, 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 no. Sorry, I was just in another uh, window. Were you um, applying for a job with Twitter? No, you? no. So, um, so, like, generally, um, I mean, I think part of it is that some of these people still haven't moved back. Um, and, I mean, he gave them the ultimatum to move back to... Well, they don't want to go back. They don't want to share his vision anyway, do they? Yeah, no, I mean, they don't want to move back to San Francisco. They they uh, they don't want to come into the office because people have gotten used to not being in the office. Um, uh, he's moved it to like a, a micromanagement uh, uh, company, which it never was. Um, I mean, it never was a micromanaging company. Um, and uh, I've, I've been hearing from my, my friends at pretty much every company now. Like, I mean, it goes from like... Uh, like any pick any company that you've seen that has had layoffs recently and they've all had like uh kpis uh, and okrs added in that they never had to meet before um and and so it's uh i think that it beyond him beyond whatever he's saying publicly uh it's it's just that we don't need as many people at companies anymore like and i've said this before like if, if you're not a programmer, really, like, we actually need more lazy programmers than we need rock star programmers now. We need the kind of person that is willing to take as many shortcuts as possible to get the job done as fast as possible. Uh, then we need, I mean, so somebody that can 10x or 100x themselves uh, and not be stressed out about it is what Elon Musk and every other company is looking for not somebody that will spend uh, a full day of work buried in the code stressed out because they're doing it the old way so everyone that's not on board with that is going to get let go oh there you go all right i think we're gonna wrap it up on that that really uh up up full you know but you're finished anyway sydney's coming for you anyway so there you go so carmen how can people find out more about you and um, get more of your knowledge, Carmen. Hopefully you will return at some stage during the year. Yes. If you will have me back, I will be happy uh, to come back on the show. But I'm mainly on Twitter, and my Twitter name is at I am Carmen K, and that's where you can find me and all my musings. Yeah, well, you're not on Instagram, are you? You said that. You know? <laughs> well, I am, but not in any professional capacity. It's just like, hey, I went skating, so it's my picture. Oh, sounds good to me. <laughs> You know, there we are. <laughs> All right, panel, I'm going to wrap it up. Thanks for the thoughts. We will be back next month and hopefully with a delightful special guest like Carmen. And more thoughts about the WordPress, tech, anything that comes across my radar that will keep the panel amused and interested during the hour. We will be back soon. See you soon, folks. Bye. Bye.